Today we celebrate what is called the Feast of Orthodoxy or the Sunday of Orthodoxy or sometimes people call it uh, Icon Sunday or sometimes Anathema Sunday. But that's not the official term. Where do we get this idea of anathema? Where does this come from? This comes from St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is of apostolic origin. So if the service makes you a little nervous or you think it's not so ecumenical as it should be, well, you can argue with the apostles. St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 said to the Corinthians, If anyone comes to your church in Corinth and proclaims to you a gospel contrary to that which we proclaimed to you, that is, if they come and teach you something contrary to what was proclaimed to you by the apostles, if they contradict the apostolic tradition, let him be anathema. That is, accursed. You say, well, that's not very nice. Again, you can take it up with St. Paul. He's of a slightly higher rank than any of us. Why would he say such a thing? Because heresy is much more dangerous than any cancer or any disease you can imagine today. Heresy attacks the soul. It is a disease of the soul. It infects the church and can cause the death of the souls of the faithful. Well, an earthly disease of cancer or some other thing like that can, can certainly kill the body, it cannot kill the soul, and as we know, some who suffer with bodily ailments are often purified and strengthened in their soul. Think of the sufferings of Job. Think of the sufferings of our Lord. Think of the sufferings of the great martyrs and hierarchs of the early church that we commemorated today. Bodily sufferings, spiritual nourishment. And so, the early church, the apostles, St. Paul, saw heresies coming into the church of Corinth. What's a heresy? Heresy is from a, it's a Greek word. It means a separating idea. Something which causes the faithful to separate from the church. To part way from what has been established and taught by the apostles. Okay, so a heresy is a thing which causes this. A heretical uh, group is one that holds to them. This is very serious. And the church still takes it, at least here at St. Elias, 2,000 years later, very seriously. We celebrate this feast called the Feast of Orthodoxy. Where does it come from? It's a commemoration of the Seventh Ecumenical Council. As you know, with the advent of Islam, there were a number of misunderstandings of Christian teachings that began to float around among Muhammad's followers. Muhammad, as you know, was illiterate and had other problems. Muhammad misunderstood the teachings of the Holy Scriptures in the Old Testament, specifically Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, where it says in the Ten Commandments, you shall have no graven images, nor bow down and worship them. Now, that is how our English translations usually go, but it's actually a bad translation. In the Hebrew there, the word is pesel, pesel, which means idol. In every occurrence of the word Pesel in the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, it is a reference to the pagan images of pagan gods. That is what we call an idol. Furthermore, the Jews, when they translated the Hebrew text in the Old Testament into Greek, about 200 years before Jesus, in what is called the Septuagint, translated the Hebrew word Pesel with the Greek word Idolon, from which we get our word idol. The, in, the, the Old Testament church did not have some sort of inordinate problem with religious imagery. We know this by looking at the very book from which this misunderstanding often comes, 
In Exodus chapter 25, a few chapters later, God commands Moses to build the ark and put statues of cherubim on top. This was the understanding of the Israelites, and this was the understanding of the early Christians. We look at the temple that was built by Solomon. It was filled with religious imagery. When we look at the synagogues in the first century, we find mosaics of what? The great saints of the Old Testament church. We find mosaics of St. Elias, a mosaic of St. Moses, a mosaic of the crossing of the sea. They put on the walls and on the floors and on the ceiling of their synagogues the images that reminded them and inspired in them the memory of salvation history and the saints of the church, of the Old Testament church. Unfortunately, there have been, on occasion, misunderstandings of Exodus chapter 20 verse 4. Not thinking that it is a condemnation of idols, which it is obviously, but rather that it might be a condemnation of any kind of religious imagery whatsoever. The first major heretic who thought this was Muhammad. And this is why in Islam it is an iconoclastic religion. You might see some designs and things on the walls in a, in a mosque, but you will not see an image of anyone. Why? Well, we don't know. But this is what we do. Well, it goes back to a misunderstanding during the time of Muhammad of Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, that what the verse was actually condemning was the making of religious imagery. Again, that would be a contrary reading to the Hebrew text, to the Greek text, and to the way in which the temple was built in the Old Testament, the sanctuary Moses built, and the synagogues in the early Christian churches. This is what heresies are. New ideas. Misreadings, often, of a biblical text. Outside of the tradition. You're probably more familiar, if you are not from the Middle East, but here in the United States, you're probably familiar with iconoclasm among Protestants. But not all. Luther was not an iconoclast. When Luther read Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, he read it as it had always been understood by the Jews and by the Christians, and that is a condemnation of the making of idols to bow down and worship some pagan god. Unfortunately, Calvin, who came after Luther, misunderstood the text and read it as Muhammad did. And this is why in some Protestant churches, the vast majority of American churches that come from that Calvin, Calvinistic line have whitewashed walls, no images. If you find a cross, there certainly won't be an image of Jesus on it. That all can be traced back to Calvin's misreading of Exodus chapter 20 verse 4, as Muhammad had misread it as well. This heresy, tragically, though it had developed outside the church, this strange idea developing within Islam eventually infected Christianity in the Middle East. Christians began to wonder and get confused about the meaning of this text from Exodus chapter 20. And so Christians began to become iconoclasts. And Christians began to take icons and destroy them. They began to remove them from the walls of the churches and break them to pieces and burn them with fire. Iconoclast means a, an image smasher. Following Islam. The heresy became so strong in the church that a council was required to condemn it. This is called the Seventh Ecumenical Council. The Seventh Ecumenical Council, at which this heresy was condemned officially by the church. Eventually, the icons reappeared in the churches. Where did they come from? You had them. The faithful, the faithful, though many priests, 
Many bishops, even a patriarch of Constantinople, had become iconoclasts. The people had kept the faith. They remembered that this was the faith of their fathers, that their grandmothers and great-grandfathers and ancestors had always had religious imagery on the walls of their churches and in their houses. And so the faithful hid the images, hid the icons in their houses, in their basements. And then when the Orthodox bishops condemned this heresy and even condemned the clergy who were holding to it, the faithful brought the icons from their homes in procession, carrying them into the church through the streets of the cities, out of their homes, down the streets, in procession, to bring them back into the churches and put them on the walls safely again. And that's what we did today. We remembered that great event and the restoration of the icons to the churches which occurred on the first Sunday of Great Lent that year. And so since then, until today, on the first Sunday of Great Lent, while we continue to remember our fasting and the penitential time, it is also a minor celebration because we remember that it is because of what the faithful kept in their hearts. The faith that they kept. And the few Orthodox bishops who also kept that faith. Because of that, the faith has continued. And so this is a celebration today of not some event that took place centuries ago, over a thousand years ago, but rather it is a remembrance of the faith of the people of God and the importance of that faith. The icons. Even today, sometimes people misunderstand their importance. As the Seventh Ecumenical Council said, the purpose of an icon, an image, icon, icon in Greek just means a picture, the purpose is to remind us of somebody who went before us as a model of our faith. Saint Barbara. Saint Barbara, a good Palestinian saint. And saint George. Saint Elias. Saint Catherine. Saint Basil the Great. We look to these individuals and we realize that we are, as the Epistle to the Hebrews says, within a great cloud of witnesses. This is why historically a church has icons about the size of a man or a woman lining the first tier of the walls. Stand up, Jonathan. Jonathan would be standing next to a full image here of St. Barbara. Dimitri would be standing next to a full image of St. George. So that when Jonathan looks over, he sees St. Dimitri standing next to St. George. And Dimitri sees St. Jonathan standing next to St. Barbara. Because they are part of our congregation. And we are part of theirs. St. Elias is a much bigger church than in Los Gatos and in 2018. These are the great cloud of witnesses who have gone before and are here with us in the midst of the liturgy, praying with us as we enter into the, into the kingdom of heaven here on earth. You can see this similar style of design in the iconostasis, where you have that first tier of icons which would typically go all the way around the church, and the most important of them, of course, being here in the front, the Theotokos and our Lord. The next tier of icons are typically salvation history, which you can see here again on this iconostasis, icons of the story of the life of the Theotokos, the life of our Lord, and the icons, that second tier, 
would then go around the church, all the way around. Stories of Moses crossing the sea. Story of Joshua over here crossing the Jordan. And then finally the third tier, which is the celestial realm, the ceiling, where we ideally would have the Pantocrator, Christ enthroned on the heavenly throne of His Father, looking down upon us and blessing His church, surrounded by the apostles and other celestial imagery, the cherubim, the seraphim, from Isaiah chapter 6. Could we have a church like that someday? I think we could. I think we could if we take feast days like this seriously. And we remember what we have received. We thank God for it. And we take this Lent seriously. Our lives seriously. We take our faith seriously. We should be pillars of orthodoxy. That is, true belief. Within our family, within our neighborhood, in our workplace. And when we do that, then St. Elias will have a church like that. Someday, I pray very soon. May God bless you.